Okay, Debbie, I'll share the presentation now. Thank you. Good afternoon everybody and thank you for joining us for the HR Lunch Club today. Um, we've got the COVID-19 update for employers which I have to say when we first were thinking of this topic started relatively um, low in content and even in the just last 24 hours has suddenly um, increased quite a lot. Um, sorry, I don't know if it's a problem with my slides keep um, moving um, but um, so today, um, just to let you know for anyone who hasn't seen me before, I'm Debbie Coyne and I'm a senior associate in the employment department in Chester. I'm joined today by my colleague Tori Shepherd, who's in our Shrewsbury office. And we also have Michael Redston from our um, Chester office, who will be on the chat. Um, if you do have any questions, please do feel free to put them in the chat and Michael will do his best to answer them. If there is anything that we've been unable to answer, uh, we will follow up on this afterwards. And I also believe that our uh, individual email addresses have been put in there. So if you do have any specific questions on anything arising from today or anything else, then please do email us afterwards and we'll get back to you. Um, so just so you're aware um, in terms of what we are covering today, um, um, first of all, um, I will be covering the new three-tier system um, that was introduced yesterday. Um, and I'll also be looking at the um, contact tracing. So looking at what is it, how does it impact employers and their staff? and what are employers and employees' obligations. I'll then pass you over to Tori, who will talk you through the job support scheme and what, what is it and who's eligible, and also the new expansion of the job support scheme for businesses which are forced to shut as a result of the tier three measures. Apologies, I am having problems with my, um, the slides not moving. Um, um, so if we just look first of all at the um, the new three tier system that has been introduced um, so Boris Johnson has uh, announced obviously most of you I'm sure will have seen um, the sorry um Sorry, someone's just sent me a message about the screen because I'm just having a problem um, moving it. Ah, oh, there we go. Sorry, apologies about that. Just some technical issues here. Um, so the new three-tier system, which I'm sure most of you are aware, um, was introduced and announced yesterday by Boris Johnson. And this is the, the purpose, really, of the three-tier system is designed to limit the spread of the uh, coronavirus. Um, and a number of areas already, we, as we know, have been subject to local lockdown restrictions in recent weeks. So the new traffic light system is designed to hopefully um, resolve that. Resolve that. Um, so the new three tier system, we've got tier one, which is the medium alert. Um, and basically those restrictions mirror mainly what is in place at the moment for the majority of England. Um, the restrictions that are classed as tier two high alert are um, really replicate the restrictions that have been in place um, in a lot of the north of England for um, local restrictions. And we now have the very high alert, uh, which is imposes the most severe restrictions. And I'm sure most of you will be aware that the Liverpool Wirral region has been the first area that has been placed into the um, the higher tier three category. Um, 
so I think really the main thing that sort of I wanted to sort of touch on with the tier system is really what what's the impact on employers in relation to this tier system. Um, so I think the first message to get across is that regardless of the tier systems being put in place, it's absolutely essential that employers carry out health and safety assessments and risk assessments in line with normal practices, but also in line with COVID as well. So in relation to tier one, all business sectors that are currently permitted to operate can remain open. Guidance for making um, the workplace COVID secure will remain relevant. Face coverings within hospitality and other public settings will remain mandatory and employers are encouraged to use screens where possible to limit contact. There's obviously the curfews on the opening times of restaurants and pubs, which will continue to apply. And the government guidance remains working from home where possible, and you can do so effectively, and that remains unchanged. The tier two level um, has some further restrictions in it, mainly in relation to the um, gathering socially indoors. Um, but that can only be within your own bubble. And really, as with tier one, businesses that do remain open to the public should continue to observe the guidance on the face coverings, the screens, the track and trace systems. And again, um, where possible and where employees can do effectively, then they should work from home. The tier three is obviously the most severe restrictions imposed, um, which sees pubs and bars shut unless they're able to operate as a restaurant. This is the one where we may see differences between regions when they reach tier three restrictions because local authorities have been granted power within the tier three um, to extend the closures of businesses um, to also include other businesses that might be high risk. So you may be aware that for the Liverpool city region, um, they've also taken steps uh, that from Wednesday, they will also close gyms, leisure centres, betting shops and casinos in, in addition to the pubs and bars. Um, and I think one of the main starting points really for employers is what does this mean in relation to our workers? If they're in a tier three, can they attend work? What if we are in the tier three area? Um, the guidance updated actually this morning um, from the government has said that travel in and out of tier three um, is permitted, but it should be limited to um, effectively essential purposes, which should include work, childcare, education um, and caring responsibilities. So. Yes, employer, employees can continue to travel to work, even if they're in a tier three area. But I think there's a couple of things that, that employers do need to bear in mind. Again, the starting point is that the government changed the guidance back in September and reverted back to work from home where employees can effectively do so. In addition to that, employers have a duty to protect the health and safety of their staff and visitors to the workplace. So obviously, when you're interpreting these restrictions at level at tier three, employers really do need to take into account um, the new measures um, and actually encourage working from home, if at all po possible, to minimise any travel, both within tier three or outside of tier three. Um, if you actually have a business that's um, situated within a tier three restriction, but you have employees who um, reside outside of the tier three area, then again, if they are able to work from home, then you need to consider whether or not you should be encouraging them to come within a tier three area, because obviously by doing so, you're potentially uh, risking the spread of the virus between areas. Um, any employers that are forced to shut as a result of the introduction of the measures may be eligible to receive government assistance, and Tory will discuss that with you later on in the session. So I'll move on to the track and the contact track tracing in England and Wales. Um, so the aim of the contact tracing is to protect the health of the public and for employers to protect the health of their workers in order to control the spread of the virus. Um, contact tracing is going to play an important role for employers in maintaining business continuity and operating a safe working environment and reducing the transmission. 
So in England, um, the contact tracing is known as test and trace, but in Wales, it's known as test, trace and protect. Despite the different names, they are both broadly similar. So when I'm referring to it, I, I will only refer to just the one name, but uh, unless I point out any differences, largely the systems are the same. Um, there is also obviously the new NHS app, which again, if somebody is asked to self-isolate, then employees should also be following the advice through the NHS app if they have downloaded it. Apologies, I'm still struggling to move the, the slides on. Um, so just, just in terms then of looking at how the track and trace system will operate, um, so, for example, um, if we have employee E, uh, sorry, P, who develops the symptoms of COVID-19, um, the main symptoms, as I'm sure most of you are aware, are a high temperature, a new continuous cough, or the loss of change to their taste or smell. If an employee or a worker presents any of those systems, they must immediately self-isolate for at least 10 days and longer if the systems haven't eased by the 10th day. And anyone they live with must also self-isolate for 14 days. And they don't need to take a test unless they also develop system, that symptoms. But your employee should notify you in accordance with your normal sickness absence policy if they are displaying, sim if they are displaying any symptoms or anyone in their household is asked, uh, it has displayed symptoms. Um, if an employee or a worker is displaying symptoms but they feel okay and it's possible for their role, then they can either continue to work from home if they're already doing so, or they should be encouraged to work from home if they can. If they can't work from home, then you may be able to consider any adjustments to the, the role that they're carrying out and their duties to enable them to work from home. Um, but if they can't work from home or if they feel too unwell, then they should remain at home they may be eligible for SSP, statutory sick pay, or any enhanced sick pay. Um, within the first five days of developing the symptoms, um, P should request a test, and tests can be carried out at, at home or through the booking systems. Um, unfortunately, some of the test results are taking sort of up to 72 hours, and in some cases even longer to come through, but during that time they must continue to self-isolate. Um, if, however, they get a negative result, then your employee can stop self-isolating and return to normal home and work life, subject to obviously any restrictions in place in their area. Um, but the employee should not come into work at all um, during a period of self-isolation. Um, so what if they get a positive test result? So if, if P gets a positive test result, testing process will now begin. Um, if P is living in Wales, a contact tracer will call them. And if in England, they may get a call or a text message or an email. The contact tracer will ask the employee to provide details of any people that they've had close contact with. Um, and there is a definition of what close contact is, which will be provided to them when they need to fill out those details. Um, it is the employee or the worker's responsibility to inform their employer if they have received a positive test result in accordance with their standard procedure. Um, and it's important that they remain in self-isolation. They will also receive a notification asking for them to self-isolate. And it's a new legal requirement, um, an obligation in, the U in England on the employee to tell their employer if they've been asked self-isolate and there are penalties in place if they don't do this. The penalties aren't currently in place in Wales but we anticipate that they will come into force. The employer can also ask for a copy of the notification that they have received asking for them self-isolate or, or providing them with the negative result or the positive result. Um, so obviously the employer will then provide details of all of their close contacts um, and the contact trace will assess whether or not to alert those contacts. Um, anybody who's contacted, so any colleagues who may be contacted, don't need to request a test themselves unless they also develop symptoms. 
um, but they will need to, to complete a period of self-isolation. So what does this mean for any colleagues? Well, any colleagues identified as part of this process should be contacted directly by the track and trace system if they're identified as being a close contact. Colleagues do not need to automatically self-isolate unless they're contacted by track or trace. But as an employer, you may want to consider additional measures if you're aware of an employee who is either self-isolating or who has tested positive. So if an employee has been in the workplace and hasn't been working from home, then obviously eat clean would probably be advisable. Um, and even if colleagues haven't been notified through track and trace, then employers may want to consider any additional measures and whether they ask colleagues to work from home if they can, um, and they've been in the same workplace area. Just to note, obviously, if you do get notified of an employee tested positive for COVID, that that is personal sensitive information and you should not be revealing the name of the employee who has tested positive. Um, so moving on to employers' obligations. For businesses uh, which are allowed to continue to operate, um, then you play a key role in protecting the safety of your staff and any visitors. Employers are required by law to protect their employees, workers, contractors, volunteers, clients, anybody else who may visit the premises from harm. So it's really essential employers operate your business in a safe way that complies with both existing health and safety legislation and COVID guidance generally and specific to your business. Um, you are obliged to carry out a COVID-19 risk assessment to ensure that the workplace is, is safe. And both the government uh, websites for Wales and England um, have industry specific guidelines which employers should look at um, and employers should make employees and workers aware of the outcome of any risk assessment and I would strongly encourage employers to continue to carry out risk assessments and revising them and updating them as new guidance comes into place and particularly with the new tier system that's been introduced. Um, all employers must also contain and collect records of staff, of any visitors, of any clients. This is really important for the track and trace system. Um, so it's really important to follow that guidance. Most businesses don't necessarily need to have the NS NHS um, track system. Obviously, hospitality venues do. It may be something that you want to consider, but you don't necessarily need that if you already have um, measures in place to ensure you you obtain all details of people entering your premises. Um, and again, really, I mean, in line with the government guidance and the new tier system, it's really important now to, to sort of consider whether it's necessary to have all of your staff in the workplace at the moment um, and whether or not you can go back from having more staff working from home if you've had more staff in the office over the last few months whether maybe you go back to an arrangement where you have sort of fewer people in the office and you stagger when people come in, whether that's start time and finish times or the days that they're in. Um, and obviously just keep on top of all of the measures that you've got. It's really, really important as well that employers should ensure they play a key part in making workplaces safe uh, and encourage workers to respond to any notifications to self-isolate and ensure that they're aware that there are fines in place as well if they don't. To support employees who do need to self-isolate, issue employees with information about where they can find links and support to help them if they develop symptoms or they need to self-isolate. Um, if self-isolation is triggered by workplace contacts, then consider whether or not the uh, business needs to consider further mitigating actions to review risk assessments. Um, and be flexible with working times and, and particularly with public transport. And I would again really urge you to look at that if you are within a tier three area because of the new um, um, high, very high risk um, measures that have been put in place there. So looking um, sort of further again with the employer's obligations, it's really important as well as your risk assessments that you review your employment policies. Have a look at your sickness absence policies and reporting procedures. 
What about your working from home policies and procedures? If you are going back to more working from home and more flexibility, have these been updated? Were they updated a few months ago? Do you need to revisit, revisit them now? It's really important that they're up to date. Um, but it's also really important that you notify your employees of any updated policies and procedures. Um, it may not be necessary that you have to absolutely update every policy. It may be that you just have to send out an email advising employees what they need to do if they're in certain um, tiers at the moment and any changes that you want to put in place, uh, depending on where an employee may work or where they may live. Um, you may, depending on your business, um, if, if you're not sort of having access to, if employees don't have access to emails, then consider putting up um, signs, notice boards, or, or sending uh, letters out to staff with any updates as well. Um, something as well that's been introduced is the workplace um, testing. It's not mandatory, but workplaces may wish to consider whether or not they want to look at workplace testing, and further details of that can be found on the government uh, website. So just sort of um, what how you'll be notified really if an employee has been asked to self-isolate. Well, as I've mentioned, it is the employee's responsibility to notify their employer um, that they're, they've been asked to self-isolate and provide evidence of that if they need to do so. Um, but again, do make sure that you make them aware of that. Um, just because the government guidelines is out there, and the news has reported this, do your employees, do all of your employees actually know that it's their responsibility to let their employee employer know? Do they know that they should be following their normal sickness absence process? And do they know actually they could be fined if they don't follow the self-isolation um, requirements when they've been asked to do so? Um, so again, it's really important that you update that information and let your employees uh, aware of that. Um, so obviously I touched before on what support should be offered to an employee who is self-isolating. Um, so I think one of the main things is keep in touch, um, keep um, communication open. But the main thing is do not, under any circumstances, allow any employee or worker to return to the workplace if they have tested positive or if they've been requested to self-isolate. In England, it is now an offence to knowingly permit a worker to attend any place um, other than where they are self-isolating. And a responsibility will lie with the employer to stop the worker from attending the workplace. If the employer fails to do so, they'll face a fine starting at £1,000. So although there are obligations on the employee, I would stress there are obligations on the employer. So it really is a two way um, communication here. Um, again, um, if anyone is self isolating, I just reiterate, encourage working from home wherever possible um, or looking at adjusted duties, because obviously, um, one thing we have found, if somebody's going to be paid statutory sick pay, or even if they're not eligible for statutory sick pay, then they may be less inclined to notify their employer if they've been asked to self-isolate. If they can do some work from home, whether that's all of their duties or part of their duties, and they get full pay for doing that, then obviously that's likely to encourage them um, to notify their employer if they need to self-isolate. Um, if an employee does not work from home, wants to work from home, then obviously you need to sort of take caution in relation to insisting that they work from home. Um, but if that's the case, then I'd, I'd recommend at that point you take legal advice on what your rights may be. Um, the government is also uh, recommending that employers do consider paying employees who have to self-isolate or are off sick because they've tested positive for COVID. So obviously that's an increased expense for employers if it doesn't already fall within their occupational health um, pay that they're getting enhanced sick pay. Um, but it is something to consider if you want to reduce the risk of employees coming into the workplace um, who should actually be self-isolating at home. Other things are obviously you can offer paid leave, annual leave if um, they have enough annual leave left. Um, 
So obviously, as I've touched on, um, for employees who are self-isolating, they provided they meet the usual eligibility criteria, then they should be eligible for statutory sick pay, even if they are not sick, but they have to self-isolate. Um, whether or not they're entitled to occupational sick pay will depend on the terms of the employment contract sick pay policy and what your policy says in relation to when enhanced sick pay is triggered. So if anybody has any questions in relation to that and whether uh, their policy may be triggered by self-isolation, if you let us know, we can have a look at that for you. Um, and the low income support pay that was recently introduced is a £500 payment for low paid workers. Again, it's subject to eligibility criteria, but obviously if you do have low paid workers who you don't think are likely to be eligible for even SSP, um, again, it's something to let them, uh, to, to make them aware of, to hopefully encourage them um, to notify you that they need self-isolate and for them to sort of check the system to see whether or not they're eligible for the low income support pay. Um, so what if there's an outbreak in the workplace? Um, you should really be notified by um, the track and trace system if obviously they have identified that there is an outbreak in the workplace. And if there is one, um, the relevant authority in Wales and the relevant authority in England will work alongside your business to look at what measures need to be put in place to deal with any outbreaks. But also, if you haven't been contacted and you are concerned about any outbreak, then you can contact the local authority um, and the public health in England and Wales to ask about what you should be doing and any measures, additional measures that you should be putting in place if you are concerned about that. Um, and then finally, just touching on employees obligations. Um, really, as I, as I have sort of mentioned as an employer, it's really important that you um, let your employees know about any new policies and procedures that are in workplace. Because obviously, if your employees aren't aware of them and they haven't been updated on them, then it's very difficult for them to follow the new policies and procedures that you've put in place. Um, but they really do need to know that they need to follow any new policies and procedures and also that they have a responsibility themselves for the safety um, of uh, under the Health and Safety Act, um, because employees are obliged to take care of their own health and safety and that of anyone else who may be affected by their actions. So obviously anyone who is required to self-isolate, who comes into work, could be putting their colleagues at risk. Um, so again, anything like that may be potentially disciplinary offence and your employees need to be aware of that. If that is something that obviously is an issue with anybody, um, then we can talk to you about that separately and what procedures and measures you can put in place to deal with, with that. Um, and just finally, I think it's really important that you just ensure that your employees are aware of um, their, their need to comply with guidelines and legislation um, currently in place in relation to their local area. Okay, I will now pass you over to Tori, um, who will um, discuss the new job support scheme. Thanks, Abby. Um, just to check you can hear me. Give me a thumbs up if you can. <laughs> okay, um, I'm sure everyone will agree that um, you've given lots of helpful advice there. It certainly sparked a number of questions which Michael has been dealing with. Um, so thanks for that, Michael. Um, I'm now going to go through the latest on the coronavirus job support scheme with you. Um, just need to sort these slides out. There we are. So as I'm sure you're very much aware, um, the coronavirus job retention scheme, as we've had up until now, um, will end on the 31st of October 2020. Um, the rules were amended back in May and the scheme has slowly been wound down with the contributions from the government decreasing since the 1st of August. Um, and then on the 24th of September, uh, the Chancellor announced the coronavirus job support scheme as part of the winter economy plan. 
The job support scheme replaces the job retention scheme and it will come into effect from the 1st of November 2020. It'll run for six months, so we'll end on the 30th of April 2021. It's intended to safeguard viable jobs in businesses that are facing lower demand over the winter due to the impact of COVID-19. And the government's objective is to encourage short hours working rather than redundancies being made, which I'm sure you'll appreciate is something we're facing a lot at the moment. The scheme will be open to employers throughout the UK who have a UK bank account and a UK PAYE scheme. It applies to all sectors and it's important to note that the scheme is available regardless of whether the employer has previously used the furlough job retention scheme. All small and medium employers are eligible for the scheme, however large employers will have to meet a financial assessment test. So the scheme will only be available to um, those employers whose turnover is lower now than before experiencing difficulties due to COVID-19. A large employer for these purposes, we're saying is one uh, which has 250 employers or more. Um, it's not exactly confirmed in the guidance at this point in time, um, but it was the definition that was applied in previous COVID-19 related legislation regarding statutory sick pay. Um, so it's very likely it will apply here too. Um, the government's not currently released details of the financial assessment test to be applied, including the time period that this will cover or how it will be applied to companies within a corporate group. Um, however, the expectation that's been suggested by the government is that large employers using the scheme will be restricted on making capital um, distributions such as dividend payments or share buybacks while they're accessing the grant. Unfortunately, we don't know yet when this guidance will be released. The government has simply stated that this will be shortly. So we'll have to come back to you on that one in due course. It's also not clear what counts as an SME or large employer as I've previously said. Both employees and workers are covered by the scheme as long as they were on the employer's PAYE payroll on or before the 23rd of September 2020. So this means that a real-time information submission notifying HMRC of a payment to that employee must have been made on or before that date. Again, the employee can benefit, benefit from the scheme regardless of whether they were furloughed previously under the job retention scheme um, and from the guidance produced to date, there doesn't appear to be a maximum limit of employees that an employer can claim for um, as there currently is in place with the flexible furlough scheme as they're limited to the number of claims that they made um, before it was, became the flexible furlough scheme. The emphasis of the job support scheme is to protect viable jobs that are capable of surviving the pandemic where the employer is able to prove that the employee, um, provide the employee with at least a third of their normal contracted hours on their usual wages. Um, therefore, the government's made cl clear that the scheme does not apply where employees are made redundant or given notice of redundancy during the period for which they are claiming the grant for them. What's not clear is whether the scheme can be utilised during a period of redundancy consultation. Um, so before notice of redundancy is actually given um, or during a period of notice if the reason for termination is not related to redundancy. For example, if the employee is given notice of resignation or if they're working notice at the end of a fixed term contract. So hopefully that will be clarified further in the guidance from the government shortly too. In order to take advantage of the scheme, employers will be required to pay employees at least one third of their usual wages in relation to hours worked. It's important to note um, that the employee doesn't have to work the same pattern each month. However, each short time working arrangement must cover a minimum period of 12, uh, I don't know where 12 came from, seven days. Employers will then be required to pay a further third of the employee's usual wages for the remaining unworked hours. 
an additional third of the usual wages for the unworked hours can be claimed back from the government through the job support scheme, up to a max maximum cap of £697.92 per month, which leaves the remaining third of the unworked hours as unpaid. Um, the table that I've included on this slide has come from the government's fact sheet, uh, which displays the percentages in relation to responsibility of an employee's usual wages, um, depending upon the percentage of the normal hours that they actually work. Um, it, it's easier to follow when you actually through, uh, work through an example. So I've put one down here for you as I thought it might help get your heads around it. Um, so if an employee's normal working wages are £2,000 uh, per month and the employer is able to provide the employee with 50% of their normal working hours because it has to be either a third of their normal working hours or more, so we're going to go with 50% here, um, the employer will be responsible for paying the employee in full for the 50% of hours that they are actually working which of course would be a thousand pounds. Plus, they're also responsible for one third of the hours that they're not working. So an additional 333 pounds. So the employer would be responsible for paying in total 1,333 pounds. The employer can then claim um, the second third of the employee's pay for unworked hours from the government through the job support scheme. Uh, which will cover an additional £330 of the employee's wages. Therefore, the employee will receive a payment overall of £1,666, which is 83% of their usual wages. The remaining third of the employee's um, unworked hours will be unpaid, which means they will not receive £333 that they would normally if they were working full time. Hopefully that's clear to you. The calculation of an employee's usual wages will be similar methodology as to how it was calculated uh, for furlough under the job retention scheme. So if the employee has previously been furloughed, they'll already have their underlying usual pay and hours used to calculate uh, usual wages from before lockdown began. Um, government guidance, again, is due to release, be released shortly, which will confirm the calculation for usual wages under the job support scheme and in full detail. The government grant specifically does not include employers class one national insurance contributions and employer pension contributions. So these must be paid by the employer, which has been the case in the job retention scheme anyway since the 1st of August 2020, um, but they have specifically made it clear here. Um, it's assumed that the employer should make the contributions based upon the whole sum payable to the employee um, in respect of both worked and unworked hours. But again, this should be clarified in the further guidance shortly. The government's fact sheet, again, um, of which I have put a link to later in the slides, um, states that employees will be able to uh, make a claim through gov.uk from December 2020. So it, it also states that employers will be paid on a monthly basis in arrears. So therefore, if claims can't be submitted by the portal until December, depending on the timing of an employer's payroll run, they may have to wait at least a month before the reimbursement each month from the government after payments have been made to the employee and reported to HMRC by the R RTI return. Um, and employees need to understand this is the case, as of course this will have a, a, um, quite an effect on cash flow. Um, seem to be going backwards on the slide here. There we go. So then last Friday, the 9th of October, um, the Chancellor announced an extension to the rules of the support scheme. Um, in relation to areas where the further lockdown measures are being implemented um, and businesses may be forced to close. Um, so the new tier system that Debbie mentioned earlier that was announced yesterday means that if the local COVID alert level rises to tier three or very high, 
pubs and bars who are unable to operate as restaurants must shut down. And depending on the local politician's agreement in those areas, other businesses such as leisure venues, gyms, casinos and adult betting shops may need to close. But this will vary between regions. So make sure you're clear on what is applicable in that particular region. We don't currently have particular guidance on the point, uh, but we can only assume that where businesses operate with, uh, within more than one region, they would be able to apply the extended support scheme in regions where businesses, businesses have been shut down. Um, but the ordinary support scheme um, would apply to the areas of the business um, in the other regions where they're still able to operate. So if businesses have been forced to close from the 1st of November 2020, they will be able to claim up to two thirds of their employees' wages, capped at a maximum of £2,100 per month per employee for employees who are off work for a minimum um, period of seven consecutive days for this reason. This extension will only be available when the business cannot operate because of lockdown rules. So will not apply to businesses who are required by local public health authorities to close um, following a specific workplace COVID-19 outbreak. So be careful if that does apply to you and you, if you do get shut down. Um, don't try to use the extended job support scheme in those circumstances. Um, the payments to employ employers again will be made monthly in arrears. So again, this will have an effect on cash flow, as of course, employees will need to pay the wages to their employees in the first instance before the government will reimburse them. Employees don't need to pay um, any contribution in this extended support scheme um, towards the wages of employees. However, they will be required to pay national insurance and pension contributions. Employers may also top up the payments if they wish, similar to um, being able to do that in the furlough job retention scheme. And then when its premises reopen, an employer can claim the standard job support scheme um, if it meets the uh, criteria applicable. Again, an employee cannot be made redundant or put on notice of redundancy during the period um, of which their employer is making the claim. So in addition to the support for employees, the Chancellor stated that any business forced to close because of lockdown restrictions will be able to claim an increased cash grant of up to £3,000 per month, rather than up to £1,500 per three weeks. Um, and they're also eligible for payment to be made sooner after only two weeks of closure rather than three. Again, we're still waiting full details of the job support scheme in the Treasury direction, which will clarify measures in relation to the business support grants also. Finally, I'm just going to go through the job retention bonus, which was announced by the Chancellor on the 8th of July 2020. Um, this relates to employers who have taken advantage of the furlough coronavirus job retention scheme. Um, We've only recently received these details. I think it was the 2nd of October it came through. Um, so we now have some further information available. Um, employers will be paid a £1,000 job retention bonus for each employee they bring back from furlough and continuously employ through to the 31st of January 2021. For businesses to be eligible for the job retention bonus, they must have a PAYE scheme registered on HMRC's um, real-time information systems, a coronavirus job retention scheme claim in relation to an employee, um, and they must have delivered the required information to HMRC. Um, the employee must be paid at least £520 on average in each month from November 2020 to the end of January 2021. Although it's worth noting that they don't have to be paid the same amount in each month. Obviously, I said it is an average, but um, one of the quirky bits about it is you can't just pay that all in one month. They have to receive a payment within each of those months, but it doesn't matter 
how big or small it is. Um, and the employee, again, must not be serving contractual or statutory notice period on the 31st of January 2021. And this specifically says, including employees serving notice of retirement. So if you've got any employees in, in that category, be careful here. Um, the government has made clear that employers who access the new job support scheme will still be eligible for the job retention bonus um, if they meet the eligibility criteria. However, they cannot claim the job retention bonus where they've repaid in full the coronavirus job retention scheme grant to HMRC, regardless of the reason, or made an incorrect job retention scheme claim in respect of an employee. Employers will still be able um, will be able to claim for the job retention bonus between the 15th of February and the 31st of March 2021. So there is only that short um, six week window where claims can be made. So if you are intending to claim for the job retention bonus, make a note of that in your diaries. Um, there's also a useful uh, government guidance document which you can use to check eligibility for claiming the job retention bonus. Um, and for calculating which employees will um, meet the minimum income threshold. I've put um, links to these on the slide at the end for reference. Okay, so obviously I've been through a lot of information there and there's a lot of things that we don't yet know. So just for ease of reference, I've put a summary together here of the things we're expecting to see that we don't currently know and we're hoping to get clarification um, from uh, in further directions. Um, so we've got details concerning the financial assessment test for large companies to be eligible um, for the standard job support scheme and how this will apply to companies within a corporate group. Um, confirmation as to whether the standard or extended job support scheme can be utilised during a period of redundancy consultation before actual notice of redundancy is given. Guidance on whether the scheme will be applicable to employees who are on statutory family leave or absent from work due to a period of long-term sickness. Full details of the calculation of an employee's usual wages. Confirmation of the amount on which uh, employer national insurance contributions and pension contributions are to be made and whether this is to include just the worked hours or both the worked and unworked hours in respect of the standard job uh, support scheme. Guidance on how the standard and job and extended job support schemes uh, will work together for businesses that operate in different regions and therefore may have some areas of the business forced to close and other areas which are able to remain open. Um, full clarification relating to the business support grant and uh, details of how claims for the uh, job retention bonus can be made. As I've mentioned, as I've been going along, these are the links I've referred to. Um, so if we are sending out a copy of the slides, at least you've got those there for reference. OK, well, thank you very much. Um, as Debbie mentioned before, due to the nature of the topics we've presented on today, our presentations um, have grown and grown and grown with all the recent government updates. Um, so I'm not sure if we've got time for um, a live Q&A. Um, Obviously, Michael has been answering questions as we've been going along um, and we've got our email addresses in the chat there. So if anybody has um, any specific queries or follow up inquiries, please, please do get in touch um, if we can help you or your business. Right, I think, yes, we've just reached the end of our time slot. So thank you very much, everybody, for coming along. And uh, hopefully you found it useful. Um, email addresses, very straightforward. It's the presenter's name with a dot in the middle and at erinandpartners.com at the end. Um, we'll be circulating information uh, um, and a, a link to the video recording of this uh, shortly. Thanks very much.